Hey, welcome everybody today to March 25th uh, bi-weekly webinar. Hey, one of the things that we're starting to look at too with our, our webinar series is really kind of reaching out, especially with the grassroots uh, season starting up back again with our, our youth. And so I was looking around and found an unbelievably great opportunity by probably no better a person to come in and talk about grassroots soccer. And I, I really caught it off LinkedIn, some of the stuff and content you had here and reached out to Gerard and and. He was open to joining us and, and provide his feedback and insights into the grassroots soccer. And so I can't think of anybody better to have than, than Gerard Jones. Right now, he's the director of coaching at Sporting City North. And like I said, thank you so much for coming in today and, and really look forward to this talk and, and really looking at improving our, our grassroots programs here within the North Texas Soccer Association. Well, with that, I'll turn it over to you, sir. No, thank you. Thanks for having me. So for everyone listening on the call, I want it to be super interactive. And, you know, if there's any questions, feel free to utilize the chat function. You can post anything in the chat or even utilize the, the reactions button. So if I go to reactions, raise my hand, like you can see now in my camera, that'll prompt me or Warren to, to pause and we can we can go to you guys as well. Um, so before I start something cool, what number are you? Quick task, 30 seconds. I'll do it as well. If you were to pick a number of a cat in this image, which number would you be? 30 seconds off you go. I mean, if you can, populate your, your number in the in the chat. Straight off the bat, we've got a five, okay. Good stuff. So Zane's a three. Love it. That's good to know. That's a good start. Or an R six. Okay. Or a one. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel you. We've got a five in there as well. Okay. I'll try, I'll try to uh get you up from a five to a six. <laughs> I'll try my best. I was borderline six. Excited to chat to everyone. Uh, eight before the call. I'm at home and I've got my five-year-old and my three-year-old running around and they're causing mayhem. So I was like, no, I'm on a call. So the, it's interesting. So the reason why I I do this is one, so that me and Warren can know the room and know how to, to pitch it. But two, this is actually a really simple activity consideration. If we're thinking about learning and how to make learning stay, we've got to know where are people coming into the experience? So I talk about red head, green heads. So red in this context could be, let's say you're an eight, right? Or you're a seven. So you're not in the optimal position to take on board information, but perhaps um, you're like, oh, I just want to get through this. Or you might be angry or whatever it may be. So it's really important to connect with the person and know why, right? So that's why, especially at our level, at the grassroots level, when they're coming into our environment, can we fist bump, high five, um, connect with the players, check on their day, see where they're at? And if they arrive as a red, can we? Can they leave as a green? Can we do something where we turn them into a green? Equally, the other way, let's say you guys have, have come into this and you know we've got a couple of threes, we've got some sixes, we've got people that are, are really excited to learn. But if you leave this experience as a red, if you leave as an eight or a seven, what have, or a five, what have I done because of that? Do you see what I'm saying? So again, just a, a great way just to prime. And this is something you could do with your players as well. So I'm Gerard Jones. I'm a director of coaching with Sporting City North. I work directly for Sporting Kansas City. I work within the youth department. And I'm fortunate that I'm coming at this from a lot of different rich experiences. I've, I'm a coach educator for US soccer, teaching on the B license courses right down to the Ds. And I also work as a UEFA coach developer. So I'm fortunate that I've worked for four out of the six continental bodies of football governance, being UEFA, CAF, CONCACAF, and AFC, mentoring coaches from the pro license right the way down to the to the grassroots levels. And working in English professional game as a head of coaching or academy coach or under-21 coach. Most recently, I was in Morocco as an elite coach educator. And that saw me mentoring coaches across the pro license and a license courses and designing our national game model and playing philosophy and methodology, as well as assisting across the different youth national teams. 
Um, so I'm really fortunate to have some some different experiences, both here in the US, in the UK, and, and around the world. Here's what we're going to cover. So we're going to go over, and I'll give you a bit more detail in terms of the considerations for activity design and how we're creating these personalized and learning uh, connected learning experiences, but really viewing learning as search in order to develop better decision makers. So here's going to be some of the things that we touch on today, just to give you an insight. So how are players making decisions? What does that look like? How does that influence our activity design? So with that said, quick two minutes, what's the one thing you want to get out of today? And you might not even need two minutes, but off you go. Populate in the chat. What's the one thing you want to get out of today? As this will give me a really good opportunity to make sure that I'm personalizing this webinar for you guys. So if there's anything you want added, I can potentially add it in. Some good comments coming through. Just had one direct to me. Learn new information about how to design player development. Okay. So what's the one thing you want to get out of today, guys? It's a great one. More on helping coach by practices that help development as main objective. Yeah, it's a great one. Last thirty seconds. Good. Okay, so really quickly, and I'm curious for the room, um, and keep these answers coming because it will help me, how to better relate to younger players. That's a great one. We'll hopefully look at that. So what does player learning mean for you? If you were to write a few words in the chat, what does player learning mean to you? Just populate that in the chat. What couple of words spring to your mind when you're talking about player learning? And I'll help kick us off. Doesn't mean that my answer is the right answer. Some good ones in here. Notable improvement on the field. Attitude change, I like that. Understanding. Okay. So what does scanning mean to you? Great one from Warren. Ability to learn through practice ideas, principles, relate directly to their success in the game. Love that. So what does scanning mean for you? If we talk about the word scanning, what does that mean? Raymond, there's an interesting point there you made. Could you just elaborate? Do you want to unmute yourself? What do you mean by collecting information? What does that mean for you? Uh, 
This is Raymond. So I just, you know, on when I teach player scanning, I really put an emphasis on collecting information. If we're scanning just to scan during technical exercises, but not collecting information about our surroundings or where our next pass is going to go or where the pressure is coming from, um, then there's no real purpose to scanning the pitch. Right. So it's the importance of knowing where to look and, and why. So you're not just looking for looking sake. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to deep dive into some of this stuff and share with you guys some videos. I want us to think about the game and I want us to look at this definition here of what is the game. What what words stand out to you guys? Feel free to populate that in the chat or unmute yourself. What words stand out to you in this in this brief definition? Howdy, Gerard. Hey, go for it. <clears throat> As a U6 girls coach, um, these words are definitely that's that second one dynamic for us, right? Uh, <laughs> U6 girls, they even trying to define those for them can be challenging. So that's definitely the thing that I look for um, is how to get these things into their little minds when they're thinking about other things. So, yeah, no, it's a good one. Great to see you, Roger, as well. Brilliant to see you. Uh, Roger just put in learning and increase through experience. I love that. Problem-solving ability. Scanning is all about being able to see solutions and become more efficient player. I love that. So if we if we connect all this together, and there's some great comments in the chat, keep these coming. Irrespective of where you are, the game is obviously it's directional. We attack one end, we defend the other. It's an invasion game. So meaning that we're invading territory, but the object of the game is to score more goals than the opposition. And in doing so, it's unpredictable. So it's forever changing. It's dynamic. It's nuanced. It's random. So if we know that the game is unpredictable, forever changing, random, how does that relate to our practice design? Does the activities that we create look like the organized chaos that we're trying to <clears throat> redesign for the players, how are we helping players search for information, optimally grip onto information within the environment in order to come up with their own adaptable movement solutions. So this is a really important starting point. So when we think about our role as coaches, it's how we design in these choices and decisions to make. These problems are based on less predictability and perhaps more variability. So often a lot of the activities, whether it's U6, whether it's whatever, and I understand every age and stage is different and we're not going to get into all that today. We're going to do a lot of broad strokes, but then it, real specific strokes on, well, what are the key considerations for design activities that look like the game and their game? So if we think about environments that are predictable, highly predictable, is that preparing them to be able to search for the information that you've all put that they need to see and know in the environment? And the answer is perhaps not. But if there's an environment that's less predictable, meaning that it's forever changing, perhaps that's going to give them more problems to solve and therefore more opportunities to, to make decisions. So when we're thinking about our role as a coach, when looking at this, and this came from an article that I recently did for US Soccer around activity design considerations for, for learning and, and player scanning, We've got to position ourselves as a, as a learning designer. So as a coach, we're a learning designer. How can we design these problems that ask questions for the players to be able to take ownership and self-regulate? So this meaning of how they're adapting their own bodies to find the solution. So in order to be a learning designer, we're thinking about the problems that we're designing for the players and think about why this might be important. So we know that kids, children, young players, they want to explore, they want to experiment, they want to be able to try things, and playful is a huge part of this. So one of the things we're going to unpack is how do we tap into the power of play? And I mean intentional, 
natural free play. What makes playing soccer fun? Why do they come to your environment? What is it about your environment that they like coming for? What is it that they want to learn? So when they come in, we're tapping into that fun element straight from the off. And how can we make it playful so it, where they can try things? And often a lot of the activities that we design, how much is exploring going on? And sometimes it's either too much or not enough. And how much are we really allowing them to be able to experiment versus are we prescribing a solution for them? And that's a question I'm posing to the group, not to answer now, but to go and have a think about. So, you know, there's a point that Roger put in there around being able to see solutions and becoming more efficient. Well, what does that efficiency look like for them? Now, if we're not designing opportunities where they can experiment and try things, then it's going to be very difficult for them to develop those skills to become more self-regulating and adapting. So this is really a, a, a key start of where we're at. So if we're viewing our role as a learning designer, where on this continuum are, are we constantly positioning the activity and the players learning? So if we go from, and this is all learning, really, you can't learn to put without performing. And in order to perform, you're learning, right? So they're coupled. But what this is really suggesting is that there's perhaps times within the activity where we're looking more at search. So there's an opportunity where there's a task or a problem or a challenge and players are having to identify information. So where are they looking for the triggers and the cues in order to solve that problem? So, you know, you, you talked earlier about coaching at U6. Well, what problems do the U6s need to see? Well, they need to stay on the ball. They need to <clears throat> recognize how to manage chaos and space. They're going to, a lot of it is me and my ball. So they're going to crash and bang into people. And that's okay. But then how do we recognize that we don't want pass to be the default? Often for a lot of coaches, they'll shout this word spread out. I almost want to ban the word spread out. You know, we've been saying it for decades and yet they're still not doing it. So perhaps we've got to come up with a different term. What if we ask the players, hey, where could you stand? Where can you run to create space for yourself or your teammate? And at U6, and even within our foundation phase, actually the ability to, to a bit like a child who's learning to crawl and learning to walk through doors and things like this, they bump their heads. That's part of their learning. If we move the kids and say, no, I want you to stand over here. Well, now we're going straight to that exploit. We're... We're taking them to the execution and we're moving them, but they haven't developed the ability to know why. How can we get them to look for information and make that decision themselves? Where's the best moment for them? If it's the pass, how can your pass or your dribble eliminate two or more defenders in this moment? Don't tell me, show me, off you go. So think about that challenge. How can your pass or your dribble eliminate two or more defenders? So I'm not telling them what to do or where to look, or even how to move, but I'm guiding the search of the player. And that's really one of our roles, is how we're guiding the attention of the player. We, yes, we want to create these game situations, we want to create these environments that look like the game, but how are we guiding where the player looks for information? And then as they're moving through, are we giving them enough time to really discover what they need to do? So these are some key things to think about in terms of variability and and space and, and this is based on some research articles and then I'm going to simplify this even further what I want you to do is take 30 seconds watch this clip I'm going to play it in full and then I'll start to stop it and start to identify what are some of the things that you notice based on the behavior of the player here so this is Gavi So I'll bring it back. Start to either unmute yourself or populate in the chat. What are some of the things that you're starting to notice? What's the player doing before, during, and after he receives the ball?
Okay, so a couple of people saying he's scanning the field, he's checking his shoulder. So let's go deeper. So if we actually look, look at the timing of when he looks. So look at the timing in between touches. So in between touches, he's looking off the ball and away from the ball and around the ball. But on touches, he's looking on the ball. Yes, there'll be information that's outside of his periphery and, and he'll be able to attend to. But it's the timing of when he's looking and where he's looking. He's trying to identify key information. Where's his teammates? Where's the opponent? How can I stay between and play between? So look at his movement now. And that critical information there, he has to look on the ball as the ball's travelling. Because if he, if he doesn't, how many times have we seen it where the players haven't made eye contact and they're moving away and the ball's been played to them and they haven't got their body feet right? Yes, Dan, so his direction of the ball, getting himself positioned. Yeah, absolutely. So if we look, he's skillfully adapting his body based on the ball. But now, look, the environment's changed. So where before he could turn and go forward, now he can't. Now it's a 1v3. So he's having to skillfully adapt his body again to, to protect and stay on the ball. And then as he's released it, he's thinking about the next action. I'm highlighting Gavi and how he's adapting his body to come up with different solutions. Now, if we notice, the type of pass is different every time. The way in which he arrives into space is different every time. Situations are different. Look at here. Now, how can you play between and stay between lines? So, again, he's receiving with pressure behind him. There was times before where he was receiving with pressure in front or around. It's forever changing. Like here, look at this, how he's had to adjust here to recognise a no-touch turn. And equally, I'm highlighting his movement and his time and his positioning. But what about the movement, the time and positioning, the cues of the defenders and how that's influencing his behaviour? So again, this is Phil Foden with Man City. You can see how many times he's searching for information. And a big part of this, and it came from some of the FIFA data, was as offers to receive. So how is he making offers to receive, movements to receive? So if we look at this now, look at the detail in terms of the space, his movements, how many times he's looking for information, how many times there was a critical scan in such a short amount of time in order for him to make these decisions on when to receive. So how he's interacting with the environment. So perception and action are coupled, and you'll hear me say this later. Like this is an important one. Like how cool is this? Look, what information has he had to identify in order to know that that solution there, he's had to do that as that player's arriving? How can you eliminate a defender with your first touch? Try to play forward with your first touch. So these are challenges that we can give to the players where they can figure this stuff out. But look at the, the detail here that he's had to recognise in order to know that he could do that as a solution. And there's other, several more examples I can give you. Jensen, where again, look at the number of times he's searching for information, he's scanning. So he's constantly searching, but it's the time and the detail of when he's searching and how that's affording him an opportunity to recognise information in the environment, to, to, to come up with a solution, whether to pass, whether to dribble or whatever. This is Jorginho with Chelsea. So again, recognising as that ball's travelling, how can I position myself and arrive into space in order to play around the corner based on where, the, where my teammates are? And there's many other examples I can give you. You know, this is from the World Cup, from uh, when Saudi Arabia did amazing against... Argentina, everyone will remember against Messi. And within a mid-block, Morocco were another good team, a former national team of mine, where defending mid-block were very good. But you think this strategy, how they're reducing space and 
the even the detail of him tracking the runner and recognizing the triggers of when to press and when to drop, when to slide and create these duels, these matchups, in order to force a problem, to force Argentina to give the ball away. So this is all based on information. So you can see the structures and the tactics, and I'm not going to go into too much of that. But hopefully, what you see, oh, what you're seeing is, excuse me, is the detail of the movement. So you're looking at the timing, like look at this. Does this reflect the activities that you're working with? If you're working with eleven v eleven, in terms of the distances between space, both vertically and horizontally, in terms of compactness. And the responsibility is how players are positioned in between players. So they're screening and shutting off passing lanes. But because of their position, they're also inviting potential passing options. So these are just examples. And again, how you can play with disguise and surprise. And this is a clip that I'll show you from Norway where we put these uh, Kogi uh, goggles on the, the eyes and we're able to track the eye movements. So I'll play it in full, you'll see it. This is in the Norwegian league. So that just shows you the what where the eyes are constantly looking. So if I slow-mo it, you can see here, he's looking at orientation of the player. Scanning between touches, looking at information around that might be useful. Where's the nearest defender, teammates? Where's the goalkeeper's positioning? Where's the last defender? Space between lines. Look now how he's looking at information in terms of the posture. So the player's facing forward. He's giving him a lot of information here. He's on touches. So I'm scanning, I'm making eye contact. But then you can see in between touches, he's looking off the ball. So he's thinking about the what if. So how we're playing in the future. And if I stop it here, as that ball's coming, he's looking at information of the ball, he's bounced it off, immediately looking at the next action. Where's the position of the opposition, the teammates, the spaces? Where's, where's the number nine? So he's constantly identifying key information. This is the game. Now, the challenge is, is that we often design environments where we focus more on the mechanics of a skill and we break that down instead of designing environments where there's more problems to solve. So this is a great quote that I want you to identify from Arsene Wenger, who's now a consultant with FIFA. And I want you to identify what are the, some of the key words that stand out to you in this sentence. So what do you notice if anyone wants to unmute themselves based on what Wenger's saying here? Okay, well, just looking at it, it's hard to, to judge. So, for example, if you do like a, the passing triangles where it's very static, not moving, there's right. not inputs available to that player to make the decision whether to use inside foot, outside foot, you know, way to pass, whatnot, where it should be from reading this right. They get that input, then decide from the input given what is the correct technique or what the, the correct idea is to be able to be successful based upon the problem given. Yeah. So are we start with perception first? We often start with perception last. And even I'll show you later on, like session design structures that are more just recommendations, you know, but often a lot of coaches, they don't protect the time of the players and they'll go into these scrimmages right towards the end. How much time have we really allowed the players to be able to recognize the information they need and apply it in a game situation? And often we train in isolation from the game. So here he's suggesting we're, we're working more on the execution first and perception last, when really it should be the other way around. And I think that's where I come into a coaching philosophy, which is a 4C approach. And I'm encouraging everyone on the call to have a think about, you know, you're fortunate you've got um, Houston Dynamo, Ben Bartlett, who's a, a former uh, mentor of mine and, and colleague, trained me within the FA. He used to be the uh, head of coaching at Fulham. He's now the director of methodology at Houston Dynamo. And he talks about this 4D approach. So his coaching philosophy is based on decisions, difference, 
definition and direction. And I'll put that in the chat. Decisions, difference, definition, and direction. So as a practice design considerations, he's thinking about are we giving them problems to solve, decisions to make, which is similar to me with the choices. How are we recognize an individual difference within the practice? The definition is based on like the field geography, pitch geography. So how are you defining that problem and the players that are related to that situation? And is it directional? Is there a clear direction? For you guys, what would yours be? And you don't have to answer that now, but it's something to think about. So as we go into the activity design considerations now, as I mentioned before, I'm sort of setting the scene in the beginning and then we're going to unpack stuff. This would be my 4C approach that I still use today. When I'm designing activities, I want to think about other choices being made. So there's repetition without repetition. I'll mention what that means later. Individual or team challenges. So how we're supporting players to, to stretch and challenge them. How are we designing competition? Because the game is competitive. The game is based on score more goals than the opposition. So are we recognising there's moments to put players against each other? Like let's say me and Warren as a matchup, that could be a good little 1v1 duel. Somebody else could be a matchup. Could it be that, hey, if this team scores in these goals, it's worth this many points. If this team scores here, it's worth this many. It could be the defending team, the longer you go without conceding is an extra point. So you're motivating winning behaviours. Or it could be, hey, if your team scores in this goal, it deducts one goal off their tally. So how are you incentivizing competition and fun? But one of the most important things is the why. So clarity for me is a 4C approach. This is mine. Is Players want to know what's the relevance to me. Why are we doing this? So if I'm a forward in your activity, U12, whatever age group, I need to get better at finishing one-on-one. -on -one, but throughout the practice, we're working entirely on possession and breaking lines, how am I getting out what I need to? Are you designing the activity in such a way where I can get a one-on-one -on -one against uh, Warren, who's in goal, let's say, and I'm getting repetitions of, of my difference? So these are things as a coach, when we're thinking about considerations, how much of your activities are providing choices for the players? You know, we, we had a guy on the call earlier, you talked about um, U6, could it be choices as simple as dribbling in and out of each other and finding ways to break out of the area because they're staying on the ball? Now, that's choice because if there's multiple balls and there's interference and there's chaos, players have to make decisions on time and space. So that's what the game is based on. The game is based on time, space, and number variations. And we have to perceive information in order to act, so we have to act in order to perceive. So this is uh, some considerations. And, and again, I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if there's any questions or anyone wants to pause at any point or challenge anything, feel free. Um, and even me and Warren just bouncing off each other. So as a coaching model, if we're thinking about information and there were some great points in the chat earlier, wasn't the Warren from people, which is awesome. And people talked about like the information and what they're searching for, what they're observing. Well, how can we make this look like their game? Well, a key consideration is, does it involve a ball? Is there a clear direction to the activity? Now, it can be multi-directional, and that's okay. I'm not saying it always has to be, you know, uh, north and south, like the game. It can be multi-directional, but is there a direction? Is there a clear method of scoring? And what's the consequence? So consequence is a really important factor because... The game is based on these moments. We've got possession, we haven't got possession, and we're transitioning in between. If we're only focusing on I'm attacking and then we lose the ball, right, it ends, or the other team wins it and then it ends, we're not designing an environment that's going to cause problems. So what are the consequences if I lose possession in this area of the field? So how can we design that within an activity that gives feedback to the players to self-correct? So there's several ways you can do that and we can unpack some of those ideas. So that's a thing of like, does your activity help players recognize a behavior that you want them to exhibit in a match? So if they lose the ball, what do you want them to do? Do you want them to go and win it back? Do you want them to track runners? What do you want them to do? Does the activity create that problem for them to solve? 
And is there opponent pressure or some kind of pressure on the ball or interference? Now, these are things that you can consider. So whenever you design your activities, even with variability, does the activity always start from the same location? So is it normally the coach always feeding the balls in from the same place? Or can there be different start points to the activity? A bit like the, the clips that I showed you before, they're, they're getting the ball from different start points. Where the player arrives and enters into the space is different. So how can we design that variability for the players? So this is really how we're manipulating these constraints, whether it's the task or the individual or the environment, to help players come up with their own solutions. And just to give you a sort of alignment with US soccer, one of the things we're talking a lot about now within the courses is the type of learning activities. And there's really good resources online on the Learning Center to check this out if you haven't already. So some of the new terminologies that we're using now is we're talking about the game is the game, right, on a continuum. The game is the normal game. If it's a game form activity, well, then we've changed something. We've, we're have we designing a, a game to look like the game, so it's a game form, so it's highly representative and closer to the game. We're attacking, let's say, attack v defence, we're attacking a large goal, We've got defenders, we've got attackers, a normal attack v defense in a half pitch practice. That could be a, an example of a game form activity. Whenever we modify the rules of the game, the laws of the game, positions, the area size, the constraints on the activity, the time constraints, or um, whether it be touches or whatever it may be, now we're starting to modify the game form. It's becoming a modified game form activity. Non game form can be anything else. Now, typically, a lot of coaches will design these isolated drills, a bit like Warren was referring to before, passing drills. Non-game form can actually still have a good place. I've done non-game form activities where I've done uh, players have a ball each and they're dribbling in and out of each other without touching each other. So they're working on mastery, but there is no goals per se, but their objective is to find different ways to beat a player. Non-game form can include pressure or no opposition pressure. In that instance, there was no pressure, so it's without an opponent, but it's got contextual interference. That could be okay. Uh, and I'll put this in the chat, contextual interference, um, meaning that there's chaos going on and it relates to the game and that causes me a problem to have to think of something to do. Okay. Now, I would definitely have a bias you've probably worked out. I'm more game form, modified game form. I'm more like the game. Create a game and design games within the game. And that's been my mantra for the last two decades. But, and it's part of my PhD as well. I didn't mention that before, but I'm studying a doctorate in skill adaptation. But there is a place for every activity. The challenge is if you're designing a non-game form, you've got to ask yourself a very serious question. Does it, relate to their game does it look like their game and if it doesn't what's the rationale for doing it so these are just examples and this is from the learning center of different types of activities that you could fit within right so in a non-game form you've got the traditional passing activity and i'll show an example of that in a minute modifier we've got perhaps a, a directional game maybe less game-like because there might be maybe a, a, a constraint involved where there's a, a, let's say, number of passes you make equals the number of goals you score. There's a, a motivation or an incentive or a reward. Um, the area size is maybe different or the rules are different, but it's, it's definitely becoming less and less predictable. And obviously game form is becoming more and more less predictable and random. And these are the buckets but when we're designing activities, how we get into that point, like what do we have to consider before that? And and these are just where I'm going to, you know, open this up to you. And even Warren, I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on this. This is an activity which is a, a regular passing activity. All right, I'll play it. So a passing drill. Player passes the ball, falls the pass, play around the cone or the mannequin. And you've got different variations. You'll see a lot of coaches do this at different ages, right? My challenge to this, whenever people talk about, yeah, I want to develop technique, my question is, where in this activity does the player have to scan? Right? So it's not, 
it's just considerations. If I pass that ball here, the only information that player has to look for is the speed at which the ball travels. There's no pressure on the ball. The cone or the mannequin doesn't give any information because it's it's static. And I already know where my next pass is going to because of the rules of the activity. I get the ball and I pass here. A passes to B. So I'm not having to look at where that player is. And coach will say, oh, no, check his shoulder and things like that. But it's not real. It's not the game. Now, how could you induce more variability within this activity? Well, perhaps if you've got players waiting in a line, let's say there's a player behind this defender, like uh, attacker, sorry, like this guy, there's a player behind. Could it be that as that ball travels, the player who's waiting for his turn can step in and intercept? How will that affect the timing and movement of this player? Because he might have to screen, he might have to protect, yeah? But often what I find is when people design activities where it's already prescribed where the pass must go next, the problem then becomes is that you end up coaching more the drill and less of the decision-making the problem solving. Because it will break down, you'll have a bad touch, the ball will hit the cone, people are receiving static, <clears throat> their body shape isn't right, they've not moved off at an angle because they're not getting any information. Now, and this is similar for a lot of different activities, right? This is just one activity. I've got, we've, between me and Warren, we've got thousands between all of us on the call. I'm trying to simplify this for the grassroots level of thinking, okay, if I want the players to get better at making decisions on time and space, how can I create an activity where there's randomness? So here there's multiple pitches. There's a halfway line. The object of the game is to score with a one-touch finish and the opposite goal. So now think about that. There's direction and there's a constraint. Must be a one-touch finish. You might take the one-touch off. <clears throat> Let's say, because obviously you'd say, well, how can you one-touch if you're 1v1? You're just dribbling yourself. So maybe you take the one-touch off. These are all the things you've got to think about as a coach. This activity is directional. You can The object of the game is to score in the opposite goal. So there's no touch limit. But... Upon scoring, you must immediately run onto another field. You can play on any field at any given time. There must be no more than, and again, you adapt this based on the numbers you've got in the activity. If you've got 10 players, 8 players, 12 players, whatever, there could be no more than 4 or, let's say, 5 players on any given field, but there must always be a minimum 1v1 on any field at any given time. If the ball goes out of play, it's a dribble or a pass in. So I'll play it in full, and I'll play it again, and I'll slow it. So you can see here, this player scores on the left field. Because he's scored, he can't run off to a field, because there must always be a minimum 1v1. These players are matched up, 2v2, but one of them scored. So this guy on the far field here <coughs> scores. So now he ends up leaving, and now it becomes a 2v3 or a 3v2, and here's a 2v1. So you can imagine within this practice, you've got reckon, you've got an, and you could do this at any level, the players are able to make decisions in time and space. It's unpredictable, yeah? Whenever they score, they change field. This player scores, so now these guys come over. Now it's a 2v3, 1v1 on here. 2v1 on here. What you'll get is you'll get natural overloads and underloads, which is the game. But depending on what it is you want to focus on, like what principle you want to really go after, you could work on anything here. You could work on when to pass, when to dribble as an action. You could work on breaking lines. <clears throat> you could work on defensive principles of defending outnumbered or equal numbered. How to eliminate a player 1v1. You can work on whatever you want. And I've even put rules in where if you beat the player and you're one-on-one, -on -one, he can't move. And let's say another player comes over and it's 1v2 and 1v3. That can happen in this game. Well, if he scores 1v3 or 1v2 or does well defending for a long period of time, he can choose. He's got a choice, the player. He can either eliminate a defender or add a teammate. So he could go, hey, Warren, come over here. I need your help. So then Warren can come over and make it a 2v2. 
So this is a, just an example of how you're creating randomness within the practice. But imagine now, and I'm just curious in the room, you know, feel free to unmute yourself. How much scanning is going to take place in this? What's everyone's thoughts? I can personally see it being a ton because as, as you score a goal, you're automatically looking up, looking for the next thing. Or if your buddy's down and he sees you in this 2v1, he's going to call you over to help. Right. You know, so I could, man, this, this is pretty neat. I like this a lot, actually. And there's so much you could do with it, right? There's <clears throat> So you've got, again, communication. We often say the players don't talk. Well, they're going to have to communicate. The coach here is facilitating and designing problems. But where you want to guide their attention to relates to the skill of the questions you ask, right? So I, I use this phrase a lot. I always say the quality of your questions represents represents the quality of your values. Because if I ask certain questions that maybe lead more towards passing and receiving, that probably influences a bias, right? If my question is, how can you beat a player with your first touch? And I'm I'm asking it in an open question versus a closed question. I'm going to elicit got them to, to explore and, and that type of thing. And that probably promotes where I'm at. I'm going to show you this activity real quick. And I'm curious. So this is an activity that I've witnessed before a thousand times. The coach has designed a wide space where he wants the players to have to play wide before they can score because they need to get better at supposedly uh, crossing from wide areas and switching play. So it's a small-sided game. But I want you to tell me what the problem is. I'll play it again in full. What's the problem? Anyone notice anything? What's your thoughts? Trevor, what's your thoughts? Or Zane? Yeah, I don't think it's wide enough. I think that their attack is is pretty central. So if they're trying to play in the wide areas and get crosses from the wide area, it looks like they're playing crosses from inside the 18. Potentially, yeah. Okay. What else do you notice? What has the player had to do? So let's slow it down. What has this player had to do based on the rule of the activity that the coach has placed upon them? Or the yeah. team should say they're on a they're on a one v one with the keeper and they've gone long head. Right, so the, it sacrifices realism, doesn't it? If that player in your team is here, and he's and that could happen, that exact situation could happen at any level, right? Go to goal, get your shot off, yeah. But because the coach has said you must get the ball in one of these wide channels, now what's happened is he's had to almost go backwards constrain himself differently, go against the realism so we can get the ball wide to put a cross in and score. So to me, that goes against the principles of play. So when we're designing activities, we've really got to think about what's the trade-off of, of what it is we're designing and how can we create this concept of repetition without repetition, meaning the getting an opportunity to work on something but under different and changing situations. So they're getting repetition of that principle, but it's random. It's under different circumstances. So these are just some things if we if we look at activity design considerations, and we've got a lot of this within the new content, within the D, the B, the Cs, et cetera, on the US soccer courses, where we talk about our principles, our game model, sub-principles, so you got your, your details, right, and your player actions. These are all part of our practice design considerations, right? What what principle are we going to train? How does it relate to how we want to play? Maybe the opposition, our non-negotiables in the club, individual considerations, and then obviously how we're going to tie this in within how we coach and create these moments. And this is just a, an, a example framework 
The challenge is, is are we creating these personalized and connected experiences for the players? So anything we design within an activity has to look like their game. But I'll, I'll use this phrase a lot, personalized and connected experiences. How are we designing these personalized and connected experiences? So personalized meaning that it's relevant to them and their needs, but connected meaning that we're joining up that approach. So within our considerations, we're, we're thinking about, and this is from some literature, where, we, where does that practice fit in terms of certainty versus uncertainty, right? So um, when we're designing activities, is it boring? Is it autopilot? Is it a lot of technical isolated practices? where there's a certainty of what to do. So there's a uh, more based on rehearsal or are we designing activities which is safe uncertainty? So it's safe, meaning that they can try things and take risks. It's connected because they can continue to go their learning in a spiral way, but we're promoting creativity and problem solving. So that, un that ability to explore, right? So, we're finding a sweet spot. And, and one of the ways in which we're doing this, and, and just an example, doesn't mean you have to follow this, but if you're thinking about assessing structure, always starting with an arrival activity is key because you're priming the players. So as soon as they arrive, can they be involved in some type of activity that looks like a game or an exercise, soccer, tennis, 1v1 games, a bit like the old play, practice, play, straight into games, passing activity, whatever it may be, but they're involved in something that relates to their individual development. Then how are you developing your, your traits and your fundamentals, the, the key qualities of a player? And how does this relate into a directional condition game or a tactical condition game? So this would be more your modified or your game form type activities. So there's direction, there's a tactical team concept principle being administered. But it's conditioned because of certain rules or constraints or challenges that we're introducing to amplify behavior, guide guide where they're looking for information. So this would be your modified game form, whatever type of activities. Now for coaches, is how much of this time is protected. So when you're thinking about your session clock, let's say, you know, I'm I'm doing an activity three minutes with a one minute break times three, right? So that's 12 minutes allocated there. 12 minutes of activity there, where for nine minutes they're playing, one minute is rest and recovery. Am I doing my coaching during the play? Am I doing it planned stoppage? So between the one minutes at the end in the breaks? If I'm doing it during the play, how am I doing it? And when am I doing it? So is it on the in the flow? Is it drive by or is it a, a pause? Is it to capture a moment, a freeze? And if it's a pause, am I taken away from their time? And when we think about how much we explain, and you know, we haven't even factored in, let's say, a few minutes to explain the activity. So now you get into 15 minutes. And then what if you you want to stop it a few times? Well, of that 20 minute activity, how much are they really playing? So here is just thinking about. And it, it doesn't have to be these exact minutes, but it's more, hey, these things, can this be protected time? So we take away from our time, but we don't take away from the player's time. So we've got to make sure that at the end of an activity, they've got 30 minutes or 40 minutes for sure within each stage of that. Let's say you have three activities in your session. They're getting meat on the bones. They're getting 30, 40 minutes of a, a meaningful activity that shifts the dial more towards the player and their experiences versus being up here where it's with the more with the coach. So this is where I'm saying we're, we're really positioning experiences for the players. Um, and these are just some things that, to take away as I'll open up for Q&A because we've got loads of time for questions um, to unpack it. So when you're planning your sessions, when you're thinking about you know the number of sessions you've got and where you are in the week, what are your intended outcomes? What is it that you want to get out of the activity? How does the learning activity relate to their game? And, and like I showed on the model here, shift more from coach-centered to player-centered. So we're really thinking about who's in front of us and what their needs are. And then this is going to be where the magic happens. How are the players being engaged? How are you engaging players? And what does your coaching interventions 
your interactions look like. So how are you going to manipulate your behavior to 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 improve but the the players? So these are just some closing things to to have a consideration for. There's lots of information here. These are just some questions to go away and have a think about, which is can we view practice and learning as search? Meaning that players have to search for information within an environment in order to solve problems. So can we view practice and learning? as search and how close does the the activity offer this variability and unpredictability so and then just something i'll show you here as a takeaway tool and this is where i really want to get questions from everyone in the room to challenge us often when coaches are designing activities they're not thinking about these three things positioning time and a movement so what is the position of the players where are they in relation to the goal the teammates how are they? How are you developing where they need to be within the activity, and then what information do they need to see in order to tap? So, is it as the ball travels, that's the timing of their movement, right? Is that the trigger for them? What type of movement they're making? So, when you're planning your sessions, try to think about these positioning, timing, and movement, because now what you'll be able to do is you'll really be able to dissect what the experience looks like through the eyes of the player. And that's where I'm going to leave off. See through the eyes of the player. See the experience through the eyes of the player. So just some useful guide that you guys can take away. And I've seen a few people writing this down, taking a screenshot, so which is good. So again, have this. Um, because that will help you think about the sort of actions of the players and that might make you change your design of your activity or the rules that you do. Because often a lot of the, the from the research that I'm doing, even with my doctorate, we're, 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 we, we say we want players to self-regulate and have autonomy, but we're actually designing more environments where we're more controlling and we're, we're designing all the problems for them. We're telling them what to do. So just a couple of things to you guys. So I'll open up for questions and then we'll do a, a reflection at the end. I'll just stop my share there. Any questions from anyone? I know it's lots to unpack. Well, I got you. I've got a couple of things right quick. If you don't want me jumping in really Go fast, for it. but Hey, so as we start to, to look at, I know that the one thing I've noticed even in the, when we're doing the grassroots or whatnot is the power of asking the kids the questions, right? So a lot of coaches I know feel very, um, insecure or they have an idea in their mind that this is the way it should be and we've we've been taught in the past through the methods of direct teaching but to really turn that on its edge and have the kids come up with answers that that we may not even expect it and is there there's ways that you've used to help get that across to coaches yeah of course you've been teaching yeah so i think a big thing is recognizing what information do i need them to search for so I gave a couple of examples before asking questions and you don't always have to have the answer to it. Right. So I think if we ask questions where it's a rhetorical question, it's really set as a challenge for the players. So it's don't tell me, show me. So you're giving them that problem, go away and have a think about it. That's not to say you can't be direct. Of course you can give instruction at times, but the danger is if they're always relying on our direct instruction there becomes a dependency on the coach and they're not looking for information within the game. So even little things like, hey, where, where's Roger's movement before you receive the ball? What do you notice about where Roger's stood now? How does that affect you? So that could be a guided question. It could be, as I mentioned before, like how can your pass or your dribble eliminate two or more defenders? Or it could be um, how can you create space for yourself or your teammate? So these would be questions I would ask or try to play forward in three touches or less. So like the power of try to is a, is a good example because try to as a phrase affords the opportunity to try without being scared of making a mistake. So you're not saying to the kid, you must take this number of touches. You're saying, hey, try to play forward in X number of touches. If they take more, great. If they take less, great. But it's try to. And they can try and they recognize that they might make this mistake. So I think try to, can you, show me. These are really powerful words 
when used correctly within a sentence that can help players. And that's typically how I've I've tried to do it. You know, Warren, show me next five minutes. I want to see different ways you can use your first touch to allow you to play forward. So how can your first touch allow you to move that ball forward? And now I'm noticing I have to spend five minutes watching Warren and then I'm looking and then I'm recognising a moment he does it well and I'm praising that. Or I might recognise he's tried it and it didn't quite come off. Great. Now that's a magic moment. That's a moment now where I can have a chat with, with him and go, hey, what happened there? What do you think? You know, and I, we can do coach interactions. Um, so it's really being skillful in your questions uh, related to your principle. It depends on what principle and what player actions are you trying to get out. All right. You know, and just one thing I've noticed, and not, not to take over the thing, but, but as you're looking at these these people that tell people what to do, I try to explain it in a way that, you know, hey, if I have to tell Freddie what to do, Freddie has to listen to what I'm saying. He's got to figure out what I'm saying. And then he's <laughs> got to apply what I'm saying. And the amount of time it takes to do all that is so much better if we teach in a way to where now Freddie makes the decision. So then if Freddie sees it really within the game on the next Saturday. He's now got the application based upon the information inputs that he's already gotten from the training sessions. And that's right. why and this has been a, a brilliant session you know, just to, to break over that or try to get, get coaches to understand is it create the environment that make people make decisions and then making decisions. Then, then they, they become great soccer players or great humans coming. Problem solving is the biggest need right now. If we even take it out of the context of the game, people are looking for problem solvers, you know, right. and in today's society, nobody needs anybody told what to do anymore. We need people that they can solve problems. And I almost think that's the magic of, of the way this is being taught and the, the things you're discussing is you're teaching people how to be problem solvers based upon information. That's it. What information do we want them to look for? I, I love the new courses. I mean, you've seen it. I'm teaching on a, a B right now in Oklahoma, and I've got a B license in September uh, in Kansas City. And I love the way the new framework is where we're looking at uh, the cues, the triggers, the, the contextual information, what information we're trying to get from the players what do they need to see in order to be able to act and right. I mean, it's funny like i'll share something real quick with everyone i'll share this slide so i have this hidden i've got like a million slides hidden. anyone knows me i've got too many bloody slides but just something you said it made me think of this so this is some research that i've took even from my own doctorate and other other um studies where basically I mean, look at it. It'd be interesting to see what you guys identify from this, but this is some key stats where it's suggesting there's an over-provision on technical, tactical information. Um, we tend to do a lot of describing the what, but not so much the how. Um, there's a lot of freezes in there, but there's in it, there's inefficiency in how and when we go in and freeze it. What's scary for me is that coaches have an overestimation on what they think their behavior is. So... This is where the power of video, we were talking about it before, is huge. So we've asked coaches through semi-structured interviews, you know, talk me through your interactions and then, oh, I ask loads of questions or I do this or I do that. Mm -hmm. And when you mic them up and you watch the behavior and you ask the players, it's actually nowhere near close. We're actually very bad self-reflectors. We're, we're, there's an overestimation on what we think we do. So there's not accurate. And then the other challenge is, this is where I'd want to highlight these areas for you guys, is minus 50% player recall. So what that means is from that study is that a lot of the information we, we're giving them, we're always obviously fighting the forgetting curve, but because there's an over-prescription on information, explicit information, there's a high redundancy, there's a high forgetting. So they actually forget half over half of everything we've covered in practice right which probably relates to a lot of people in the room and they're like god we worked on this on tuesday why aren't they getting it we worked on this last few weeks well they actually only retain six percent of the information even a week later just one week later so just imagine how much re information is retained even after that and a lot of that is because only two percent of the information the representative information that we're designing for the players allows players to self-regulate, allows them to come up with their own solutions, allows them to 
figure out the right technique in that moment and adapt their bodies. Problem solve, as you said, Warren. So that to me is is scary. You know, if we're thinking about um, this stuff, what I showed earlier, representative information, the information we're designing, only 2% of it allows players to self-regulate. So what's the other 98% doing? We we need to design more environments that look like their game. So that's, that, that's where we need to be. And perhaps a, a part of that is thinking about some of this stuff. You know, like if you look at timing, so I, I just put these little definitions for timing. These are qualities, right, of a player. So being able to choose the right moment to act. So when do they decide to act? How do they sense that's the right moment to act? What triggers and cues do they need to see that will influence their timing? Or if it's their movement, how do they use their body? How do they manage their speed, their direction, the type of movement they make? Is it an in-to-out run, an out-to-in run, a diagonal, straight run? Is it a run to receive? Is it a run to deceive? Like, what is it? It's interesting. If we ask these questions when we're planning our activity, we'll probably go through the eyes of the player and their experiences versus our eyes. Um, and a lot of these questions, you know, you could design <laughs> players and we don't have to have the answer to it. Now, I think that's a bit like what you're saying, Warren, is create an environment where there's problems to solve. And then going back to the article, you know, are they getting realistic opportunities to get meaningful repetitions and, and be able to keep trying it? Right. You know, one thing that kind of sticks out to me and just looking at my own past and growing up and playing, and as you walk around or go anywhere within the Metroplex, within North Texas, and you just watch the grassroots practices, right? It seems to me that people don't know, they get nervous, and they, especially with a brand new coach, and you think, number one, fitness is important because of soccer, so you see a lot of running jumping jack stuff like that then you also go in you see a lot of line drills driven through cones and passing things but almost i wish there was a way and you know you could explain to this grassroots coach maybe a mom that's first time or a dad that's first time they ever experienced the game sometimes it's better just to scrimmage you know oh, to provide yeah. feedback and different things just play the game and, it, yeah. and it's kind of hard to get that information through to, to people but do you deal with that within kids are you seeing the same things yeah. Yeah, I see the same things everywhere. We're actually trying to influence it, and we've done a really good job of changing it. And I'm doing some workshops even uh, with the recreational side because I'm so passionate. I want to I want to get it right. And it's painful for me to see activities where people are just stood in a line waiting for the turn and dribbling out of cones and all this stuff. Because um, what I say to them is I ask them the question, well, where in the game would I would I do that? And how much repetitions are they getting of that, right? So if I go once and I do that for however many seconds, 10 seconds or whatever, I probably have to wait three, four, five minutes, depending on the length of the line, before I get another bout. And those actions, they actually reduce the peripheral vision of the player. They, they re reduce it. So instead of encouraging players to try and get their eyes up and constantly have to look for information, they're actually attending to the cone. They're attending to a marker on the cone. So we're training them for a different game. So when I word it like that, and I say to co players and coaches, like, hey, even at rec level, or let's say a mum on the call or a dad coaching for the first time, is like, look, I really want them to get better at dribbling. And I, I, I've seen this drill and I want to do it. I would say, what if you gave them all a ball each and you had them dribble in and out of each other without touching each other. But the challenge was is that every time they beat a player, can they immediately attack an open space? Or it could be like, let's say there's gates or spaces. And it's if you beat a defender, a guard, it's worth three. But if you dribble for an open gate, it's worth one. So you're rewarding the choices they make. And if there's the open space, I'll go into that. And that's okay. If it's a space to beat a defender, I'll try and beat the defender. If the defender wins it, they can break out as well. Now they stay on the ball. And now I become a defender. And that's the real game. So there's consequence. I've lost the ball. Now I've got to go win it back. Excuse me, I'm a guard. And I can go anywhere. <laughs> Excuse me. And I can, you know, try and protect as many different spaces as possible. But for players, they're trying to navigate by moving the ball, you know, and staying on the ball. So that's just a real simple game that you could do. And there's many other variations 
he said the best one, which is just playing a game. Who's to say you couldn't just go, hey, there's an end zone, there's an end zone. You don't even need a goal, or you could add a goal. And how can you beat a player with your dribble? Show me different ways you can beat a player. You can and try to score by beating a player one v one off the go, and then introduce other rewards for that. Right? I mean, even That's if I went back, yeah. So it's and again, it's um, we talk about this as well. Like, how are we incentivizing the behaviors that we want? So an activity design consideration is behavior. Coaching is about changing behavior and creating habits, and hopefully we're we're forming good habits, right? But often right. a lot of the activities that we design are actually forming bad habits. A bit like that one I showed you where the player is actually going against the natural thing in the game. So I always say, hey, do you would you if this kid did this on Saturday, what would you say to him? Oh, I'd say him to do that. Right. So what why are we why are we designing something different? Um, you know, the so th that's what I would say to anyone listening is you know, try and st don't steer too far away from the game. Try and stay as close to the game as possible because you're going to do less harm, you know, and the kids are going to make mistakes and they're going to learn and, and think about how you're incentivizing behavior. What are you going to no, do to hold it? it? No, thank you very much for that. Does anybody else on the call have any questions before we close it out? Because I know we've hit the hour 14 mark, but it's been unbelievably good and it's unbelievably appreciated. Yeah, any questions, challenges? All righty. Hey, so with that, um, I will close this out for, for this week's edition of the bi-weekly webinar. I, I want to say thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us as we continue the, the process of trying to grow. I, mean, I think so. this is unbelievable good content that I think we need really going into the grassroots season, especially with the spring. And so once again, on behalf of North Texas and for our coaches, thank you very much for, for taking your time to be here. No, thank you. I'll just, I'll share this for anyone who wants to reach out, you know, follow us on, I know it's called X now, old Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out. And if there's any other stuff, I've, there's a coach education app where you can access a ton of information um, that's free to download. You can get that. And again, you've got my number down there as well. If anyone wants to reach out and share ideas, you know, you're, you're more than welcome to. Um, and have a think about where you are now. I'd love to know your number real quick. If you want to populate that in the chat um, compared to where you started. And just a massive thank you to everyone. All righty. Once again, thank you very much. And and we'll see everybody next round as we have Thomas. Uh, we have to struggle with his name, but with <laughs> It's a Dutch guy, unbelievably good. And so it's going to be exciting for another round, but I think we're going to develop in a way of a coaching, coaching methodology for the next one. But this will close it out and say thank you very much, and, and we'll call it here. Cheers, mate.